Welcome to the show. Some say Rastafari are misunderstood, maligned, and discriminated against. On the other hand, it is implied that Rastas are well-meaning frauds and dreamers, or focus Rastafari. Are they Rastas or rascals? And where are they now? Let's introduce our panel. I guess what we should do at the top of the show is tell people what does Rastafari mean. Anyone can take it on the panel. The Rastafari means head creator of creation. Mm -hmm. Rest in the tent of his imperial majesty and perilous child, not sad. Okay. Shall we go with that? In power of the holy trinity. The world Rastafari means head creator. Mm -hmm. Fierce corn prince. He used to be feared. The word Iris Rastafari means power of the trinity. Might of the trinity. Hello everyone, I'm Diana Wright. Welcome to the show and what a show this is going to be. Whenever you hear Oliver or Oliver Yalarge, the name Oliver Samuels come to mind. He is hot in Florida, New York, and in the Caribbean. He has made the Jamaican accent acceptable. Tonight we meet Oliver Samuels and the cast of the popular comedy series, Oliver. And first we welcome Bollier Johnson. Mappy on the series, and next we're going to meet the lady. She's sassy, she's funny, and she looks like a movie star tonight. She is Anne Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I think he is born with funny jeans. You know the jeans in your body that make you funny. He is all of us. All right, okay. Let's hear. First of all, I think everybody wants to know about the relationship between Anne Marie and Oliver. Why do you guys fight so much? <laughs> and to tell you the truth, we fight off and on. Father daughter. <laughs> Father daughter. <laughs> One of the members of the group, Steel Pulse, he is none other than David Hines. He gives young people lots of motivation by singing the song Strive, and he also says, No gimme no crack, shine head! <laughs> okay, and we welcome you guys to the show. Thank you so much for coming. I guess what I should ask first of all is, since Shine Head got such a roar for that, why did you decide to do those two songs? They are anthems almost. Well, the uh, strive is an esteem builder for those with low self-esteem mm -hmm. and a very low morale. So what I'm trying to do is build morale and self-esteem and give those who do not have a fighting spirit, who cannot find it within themselves to go and find a job, or even if they have seek employment, to try a little bit harder. And some people have come to me and said, thank you, Shiner, for making that song. You've given me the fighting spirit. As a matter of fact, I'm even gainfully self-employed. You know, <laughs> Give me a crack. I've seen my own friends die off crack and fall by the wayside and it doesn't make you any more good looking it doesn't help your intelligence it's not the guarantee to get to heaven when you die not the guarantee to get to an ideal relationship or marriage whilst you are alive and even if you do make a little money off it you're going to end up getting high off your own supplies and the authorities are going to get you anyway so either way you can't <laughs> okay that's great mom I remember how grown up I felt the first time somebody mistook my voice for yours when I answered the telephone. I thought that was a wonderful compliment. I still love it when people say that I remind them of you. I love it because I happen to think that you are the most wonderful mom in the world. Hello everyone, I'm Diana Wright. Welcome to the show. How do you feel about your mother? Do you love her? Do you like her? Is she your friend? 
Has she been a positive influence on your life? Do you think she controls your life too much? Our focus tonight, Mother's, Mother's Day is just around. Well, I feel the greatest feeling when I think about my mother. Which is? Love. Yes. I understand that you have a very close relationship. Has it always been like that, or is it something that has developed as you got older? No, it has always been like this. A any special kind of daughter-in-law you're looking for? Yes. Okay, let me hear it. You would like to hear? Yes, because maybe I like to apply for the okay. job. <laughs> if you have got the qualities, of course. What are some of the qualities? The qualities are just a nice, decent girl. She don't have to be rich. Mm -hmm. Pretty, either. But what I really want for Shaba is someone that respects his mother. I know it's hard to say, mm -hmm. but because the young people of today, they do not respect the elderly. But yet still, I would like someone that respect me for what I am. Okay. Not say in church, them don't whine. Yeah. Meaning, say, why whine is synonymous of vulgarity. Yeah, okay. yeah. well, Africans have been whining for years and they never come up with some little things. So why now we going to interpret that? That is the same that I about racism, you know. Because white people don't whine. Okay, all right, white people don't whine, but we have to go to a break. What we're going to do now is ask Dougie Fresh to do us something that I consider international flavor. Go ahead, Doggy, and we go to a break. Back in a moment. Whining is good for you. <laughs> this is called the Human Beatbox, and I made it up in New York City as a part of rap. I could play any form of music, and I'm going to just do a couple of things just to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Welcome to the show. And tonight we're talking about something that's very dear to some people's heart. But how do you feel about those who live in the ghetto? They say you think they are no good. And of course, when we refer to ghetto, we speak of the same thing that the Americans call in a city. And we're going to introduce our panel now, Michael Davidson. And Michael, you say you live in the ghetto? Yes. Okay. How long have you lived in the ghetto? 22 years. Still living there? Yes. Okay. All right. And then Pauline McIntyre, the lady sitting beside Michael, says that people in the ghetto don't have any self-esteem and they should think good of themselves and then everybody else will. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Then there's Christopher Gibbons. And Christopher, you agree with Pauline? Yeah. All right. We'll hear your view in a moment. Call us, uh, what is it, Carlos uh, Nesbeth. You say you live in the ghetto. Yes. How old are you? 17. Okay, you've always lived there, yeah. still living there. Yeah. Have any plans to move? No. Okay. All right, let's start from um, Michael and ask Michael, what, what's your def definition of, of ghetto? Okay, my definition, it's, it's a community mm -hmm. where people can live, a mother, a father, and a child, mm -hmm. just as an uptown area, and be happy. Okay. That's my definition. All right. On my talk show in Miami, I remember a lady calling, and she did say, she was from the lower rank of society and she did mention and i want dr smudge or evelyn to comment on that that she's never had an orgasm despite the fact that she had five children she went on to tell us on the telephone that all she experienced was a, a back on the on the bed and her her panties being pulled away so i don't know if if, if, if that is something that we really need to teach our people more about because you see in the other societies like in europe and in, in america it's a more open society where sex is talked about. Jamaicans or Caribbean people seem to not want to talk about sex, even though it's something that we do. The, the last point you made about women not experiencing or orgasm doesn't necessarily restrict itself to any social class. Mm -hmm. um, it cuts across the entire social class, okay. all the classes, with respect to issues, approach to sexuality and self and stimulation. Mm -hmm. And I think men being unaware of the woman's needs and desires and wishes and aspirations cut across all the classes too but it's just likely that the man from middle or upper class may be exposed to more options so he may lock up on doing, doing the right thing yeah but that might not even be so necessarily agreeable because 
As I mentioned before, the gentleman who said to me the other day that my wife has an open checkbook and she can spend all the money she wants, why does she have to quarrel that I'm not home tonight? Well, the money is not you. No, See well, over saying? time, many relationships drift into that kind of context. Where th there are many women who are happy with that kind of relationship. Fine, but what about those who are not, though? Well, my original point, negotiation. Go ahead, sir. Um, this question is directed to Cindy. Um, I've, I've wanted to know this for a long time. Um, how did you and Bob Marley get involved? <laughs> to be living in the same building. It's oh. basically what it boiled down to. He was living upstairs and I was living downstairs. So we would <laughs> see each other as we came and went. And we would play football and I'd go about my work and come home. And we began talking to one another, getting to know each other. And um, I guess we made some kind of an impact on each other. <laughs> <laughs> son as a result of that, right? Okay. Hello everyone, I'm Diana Wright. Welcome to the show. And tonight we're having a special show with an international audience. And we welcome them to the show. First of all, let me introduce Virginia Saris from Hawaii in the United States. Welcome to the show. And then we have Nena Yuchovu from Nigeria. Cecilia Hanna from Venezuela. <laughs> Louise Valle from Canada, and you're from the French speaking part of Canada. And then we're just going to ask Sister Padma to stand down there. She's from India. And Sister Vishante from Trinidad. Meline Burnett from Guyana. <laughs> Noreen Bristol from Grenada. <laughs> and later on in the program, we're going to speak to Detective Inspector Kelso Small over there, and he's going to tell us about... He's going to tell us about the, the problems in crime at Christmas, because, of course, you know we do have an increase of crime. Senior Super Superintendent Rudolph Dwyer, also on crime, and Inspector Iona Ramsey, who we see on her bike on the road. <laughs> I find a disgrace when uh, a seemingly reputable production house like Penthouse um, could be associated with a racist song like, like Browning. Uh, it's a disgraceful song. It, the the, the, the rhythm is, is, is fine, it's very, very catchy, and it's difficult to resist it. But I think in a production house that has produced a Tony Rebel shows up this schizophrenia by producing something like that. When well, she and wait a minute, so good thing you brought it up. Bougie Banton was supposed to have been here, but he's on tour. And I brought that up today. I was talking to my stylist, and I said, how could they sing a song about Browning? And he said, well, they sing another one about blackness. Yeah, that's, after, <laughs> that's after the controversy. Okay. I think Bougie can come for that song, Man for Dead. You must, you know, fill up man with lead. I mean, this graceful kind of thing. I mean, which producers could feel proud to be associated with this kind of vulgarity? I mean, this is a, I think it is anti-humanistic. I, I think the Catholic Church has come under a lot of attack about homosexuality in the church. Do you have any, anything you'd like to say about that? Is it a big problem, a little problem well, in Jamaica? In the States, it is a big problem. It's a problem. Uh, there's a red flag in Jamaica that I never knew like there is with regard to homosexuality. If you want to get an issue going, just talk about that. Okay, let's talk about it then. <laughs> we want to get an but, issue going. Then. But I think uh, what we need to identify when we talk about homosexuality is the distinction between uh, the orientation and the act. Mm -hmm. So the orientation towards the same sex, one might have, one has, but whether he or she is acting that out, mm -hmm and acting homosexual. You know, that's the distinction. With regard to priesthood, celibacy is celibacy regardless. Whether you are homosexual in orientation, heterosexual in orientation, or both. Well, why is it then so prevalent, homosexuality in the Catholic Church? I don't think it's necessarily prevalent in the Catholic Church. It's prevalent in the society. This is that people seek to focus it 
in the Catholic Church. Okay. You know, I, when I was on campus studying sociology, I think it was Dr. Simard himself who gave us, told us that the study was done, it was really like 33% of my men were homosexual, were bisexual. Okay, bisexual. Yes. Sometimes I wonder why, why we see to become so hard with respect to the homosexual. Because in the eyes of God, you know, all sin is sin. Mm -hmm. And the adulterer, or the fornicator, or the thief, or the liar, I'm going to need the same Or the time. gambler. Or the ga well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.